Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to do a review of our review copy of Shores of Tripoli, the 2020 war game from Fort Circle Games about the First Barbary War. Let's jump in and get started with our one minute power review. I like this game because it's a very accessible light touch game. So it's about eight pages of rules. You can learn it in about a half an hour. It plays in about a half an hour to an hour and there's a surprising amount of depth to it. This is a fantastic game for introducing wargaming to those friends of yours who've never played war games before. Also, I think there's a lot of value here in the educational aspect of teaching people about the birth of the U.S. Navy and about the first Barbary War. When you play this game and look through the designer notes, you're going to learn a lot about the history. Components work together nicely with this whole system. Very colorful. You've got tactile wooden pieces. They help draw people into the game and just make you want to play. Now, if I had to mention a couple of minor drawbacks. This is a full price game. You know, I've seen it on sale mostly for about $65. It's got one mode and it's got a solo bot mode. Sometimes I was wishing for a little bit more. Secondly, there's a lot of dice involved and one aspect of gameplay in particular might have a slightly higher luck element than some people are gonna be satisfied for. Now there's our one minute power review. If you wanna stick around for more, let's chat in depth about each one of these topics. Alrighty, so let Let's talk in a little depth about each one of these topics. First of all, it's accessibility and the quality of play. Um, you know, th this game, the rule set here is relatively fast. It's 12 pages in the back, two or three pages really are about more about the solo rules than the two player rules. You've got a two player mode and then also you've got a single player mode where you can play as the US against the tri Tripoli AI. There's no vice versa where you can't play as Tripoli in the single player mode. So you've got two game modes here, really fast to learn. And when I first read the rules and I first kind of looked at it, you've only got a, a, a small number of mechanics, right? You've got naval combat, you've got land combat, you've got some pirate raiding, uh, you've got the victory conditions. I mean, I'm not getting them all here, but you get the idea. There's a half dozen kind of key things to understand about the game. So as you're kind of reading through things, you think, wow, this is a pretty simple game, right? And then you've got uh, card decks. You've got a AAA card deck and a US card deck that kind of drives play. So on the surface of it, as I was looking through this, I thought, well, okay, this is the kind of game that, you know, before I started playing, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna play this a couple times and then I'm gonna be like, yeah, I kind of got this. I just don't, didn't see a lot of complexity to it before I started playing. And then I started playing and now I've played probably, uh, oh gosh, a good, probably like eight to 10 games now over both modes. And that's not the case at all. The game has a lot more depth that kind of emerges as you play. You know, it's that interplay between the various mechanics and the card driven aspect. And almost every game you get, the order of cards you're gonna get is gonna be different and that's gonna limit you and give you access to certain strategies and options. And even though your win conditions are relatively narrow, you know, for like the Tripoli player, your options for winning basically are getting 12 gold coins, which is your most direct route, and that's what you're going to be focused on in the early part of the game. You can sink four frigates, but that's kind of, you know, that's almost like an accidental opportunity that's hard to me, it seems, excuse me, as a Tripoli player, it's almost to like work for that. It kind of has to fall into your lap a little bit, and then maybe you can push on it. Or you can try to wipe out the U.S. Army in the, at Dern and try to wipe out the US, US, U.S. land forces. But that's more of a defensive element of play. So, you know, kind of thinking, wow, I feel kind of limited as playing as Tripoli. But then you realize that the cards are going to drive a lot of different aspects you can play. You can either build or raid or you can engage allies if you've got those. You can do other things to pull U.S. forces away from their focus. So you're constantly trying to balance this raiding capacity with your defensive capacity, with the cards that you've got and all of a sudden you find like wow I'm only playing for about a half an hour to an hour but this is forcing me to actually think a lot I can see a lot of different ways that I could play this likewise is the US player which I think the US players game is a lot more complex not a lot more complex is more complex right you've only you've got a couple of ways to win as the US player which is basically you can either set up the conditions of putting in place 
uh, treaty of peace and amity, which basically is enforcing a peace treaty by making the situation so bad for Tripoli that they view it as kind of hopeless and they're like, okay, fine, we'll just sue for peace. Or you can have a, an all-out raid on Tripoli and you can win there and win the game. And that seems to me to be the kind of a more of a desperation ploy. So as the U.S. player, you're trying to set up these four conditions for being able to enforce a peace treaty. And at the same time, you're trying to balance your defensive role too, because you can't, if you just take your hand off of Tripoli's raiding capacity for just a little bit and stop paying attention to it, all of a sudden you can find out like, oh damn, I just lost because Tripoli was able to successfully raid. So even though there are a limited number of mechanics, again, these card bridge plays, and you're constantly trying to balance and dance among these different mechanics, switching to offense, going on defense, that there's just a, a lot of depth here. I thought after a handful of plays, I would think I've been here, seen this, done that, and this is good. I'm finished with the game. But I don't feel that way at all. This is a game that I honestly feel like I'll be able to come back to and enjoy. And again, I, you know, it's a half an hour to an hour play once you kind of understand the rules. Some games are going to play faster than others depending on what happens and things like that. But I could see this easily as being used as a filler. You know, you've got, you've just played a two hour game and you and a friend are trying to figure out what to do for the last hour because you've got some energy left, but you don't have enough energy for a three hour game. This is a perfect game for that situation. Or you've got a short evening, you've got dinner, it's a work, you know, it's a work night or something like that. You know, let's play a quick game. You don't really want to break out something that's going to have a bazillion pieces. You want something with a light touch and a light footprint that's still going to engage you intellectually and give you the satisfying kind of experience. This game will fit that role really well. So for that role, this game will stay on my shelf. And I think it's a game that has a lot of replay ability, a lot of value, and a lot of lasting, uh, lost the lasting capacity. I mean, it's just a game that I think you can keep on your shelf and come back to now and then and keep playing it and enjoying it. So for that reason, that was surprising. I really thought the simplicity made it a simple game, but it, it isn't. There's an emergent depth to it that I think really makes the experience positive. So that, that's a big thing, and I've rambled on long enough about that. Let's talk a little bit about you know, how that in turn plays in. I think this game works really well because of its accessibility and its light rule set. It works really well to introduce people to wargaming. I tested this out with a friend of mine who's not a board gamer, not a wargamer, and not a video gamer. Uh, you know, so not a person who's going to be playing games, but a guy who likes history, right? He's just an, he reads a lot of nonfiction. He had read The Six Frigates, for example, which is a book that covers a lot of the time period by Ian Toll about this time period. So he knew a little bit about the area, era had forgotten a little bit, but knew about it. So we had dinner and we broke out a couple drinks and we threw out the game board and kind of played. Now, first of all, you know, like if you're a war gamer and you see like an eight to 10 page package of rules there you're like wow this is gonna be pretty easy to learn but if you're not a gamer and you see like an eight to ten page packet of rules you're like oh my god we're gonna spend a half an hour just learning how to play the game you know so there's that little bit of kind of a a different worldview i think towards games and rules that exist there but we spent like 20 minutes kind of kind of working through the rules and just explaining the key mechanics and some of the victory conditions and then i suggested we play uh, a face up, getting your cards open, kind of a learning game like of that. Just so we're showing cards and I was talking a little bit about the thinking and talking a little bit about some of the strategy in a couple early years. And then after we played a couple years like that, I said, I said, hey, do you want to start over? He's like, no, no, let's just keep going. Let's play. And I didn't have to explain anymore. And he was totally into it. And he was making some really good moves. I let him play as the Tripoli player because I think the Tripoli player is easier for someone who hasn't played a lot of war games or a lot of complex games to wrap their heads around. You know, that raiding mechanic has a lot of variety around how you can accomplish it, but still you're kind of singularly focused on trying to raid successfully, which makes it, I think, a little bit easier to grapple with as your first game. So he played that. We played for an hour, we talked about the history. You know, you're pulling up these cards, like Burn the Philadelphia, Launch the Intrepid, uh, the Daring Stephen Decatur and stuff like that, the treaty that they signed. And so those in turn, as we're kind of playing the game, led to this kind of side conversation about the history of the first Barbary War. And it was just all together, when we finished with an hour and a half, it was a very enjoyable evening. Now, I don't think he's going to become a gamer because of it, but I think, because he's... You know, he's an older guy and he, he's, it's a whole life. You know, he's, it's, he's just not necessarily dialed into it and the experience of being a gamer. But 
you know, at the end we said, hey, what do you think? This was really fun. He really enjoyed it. He had a good time. We had a wonderful evening and it was a very positive experience. So for that reason alone, I, c I can think of like five or six people I've got like that. And I can think of a couple more that I think I might be able to introduce wargaming to that would be an attempt to try to convert them to the genre. And I think it has a lot of functionality in that type of place. It's, I, I used in my unboxing, I used the term emboss ambassador game. And I think the game works really well as that. The other use of the game, I think, if you're an educator, like high school or even college, and you teach any aspect of U.S. history that would involve this war or the birth of the U.S. Navy or the growth of the, the nation of the United States during the you know, late 1700s and early 1800s, I could see you bringing in this game as a really cool learning assignment for students. I mean, you could give this to a couple students, say, hey, read the designer notes, play the game, and then create something like a paper, a report, a video, a play, a drama, something like do a little project on the first Barbary War and share what you learned. And I think you could learn a lot more by this dynamic engagement with the medium rather than you would learn from just reading a couple of articles on it or reading a chapter in a textbook. So I think there's a ton of educational uh, p potential in this. And the reason why also is, again, that accessibility. It's not going to take people a long time to learn how to play. It's not going to take people a long time to play. You know, if you had like, if you're a high school teacher that had a block schedule where you've got hour and a half classes, you could probably have a couple students work through this in one, maybe two classes. So I think there's a ton of educational value in here. And even as we kind of was playing with our friend, that was, I think, one of the strong currents that made our experience really good was the idea that we're able to sit there and talk about the history and things like that and have a really good time just talking about the birth of the nation. We talked about books. We expanded off into other elements of history that surrounded this conflict. And it just was a great evening because of the historical strength of the game itself. The last thing I'd like to say in terms of positives is I really like the design of the board, the pieces, I think it's got, you know, the colors and the, the set, the design palette, the box itself, the rules, the cards are just beautiful. And I think that for the, its purpose, again, the accessibility or for introducing the game to someone else or maybe even just kind of teaching the history of this time period, that design element is a big plus. It just, you look at it, you get the tactile nature here of the various pieces and things like that. And you're like, you want to touch it, you want to play, you want to jump in, you want to read the cards. You're like, wow, these cards are gorgeous. It just sucks you in. And so really, I think the, f the fine details of the design are a, a big element in terms of kind of drawing people into the experience and making it a positive experience. So kudos to, I know this is the first game from Fort Circle Games, but if this is any indication of their design capacity, I think they're really on to the right idea because a game that has this element of design just makes it more enticing. We know that with any kind of entertainment experience and the way this is designed, I think just really pulls people in. So that's a positive. Uh, a couple negatives that I mentioned in the one minute power review, I do want to mention, I'm not sure really, in, to be fair, I'm not really sure they're negatives. I'm kind of, I have mixed thoughts on them. The, the biggest one is that I've noticed the game retails for upwards of $60 here in the United States. And, and you've got the one main campaign, the two-player experience, which is the first Barbary War. And then you've got the solo bot that allows you to play as Tripoli. And, you know, I, I say this with caveats because I would much rather have a one one-dimensional experience that's been heavily play-tested and heavily thought through. And it's apparent that this has had a lot of time spent on it, that everything's been tested, right? There's been a lot of consideration to the two-player experience, to making it a rich and vibrant experience. So I would rather have a game that has one highly refined experience than a game that has like five half-tested, half-designed, like, oh, here's some optional rules you could try kind of thing that when you actually test them out, they're kind of half broken and they don't really work. So I would rather have something like this than something that has a lot of options that aren't really tested to a large degree. But having said that, at a price point of 65, 66 bucks, I think is what I saw it on Amazon and stuff like that, I, wonder, I, I feel like it could offer a little bit more, like uh, maybe in, you know, an optional, few set of cards that could bring in a more an advanced mechanic. Maybe some AI rules for how, you know, you could play an AI as the US player and play the as a human play as the Tripoli player. Maybe some optional scenario variants or something like that to try. And I, I realize 
those things are super easy to say, right? It's easy just to say that. Play testing those is hours and hours. Designing those is hours and hours and hours. And there's a ton of work in it. But having said that, just as kind of looking at that price point for the game and looking how it matches up against other war games in that similar price point level, I still feel like it could offer a couple more things. And if it did, that would be awesome. You know, like another six cards for each side that add a mechanic and make it a little bit more complex or something like that to make it rich. Now, having said that, I think it's also important to mention here another caveat is that this design obviously, it, you know, they didn't skimp on the design with the wooden pieces, with the wooden gold coins, the way the map is, the mounted map and everything like that, the high quality of the cards and all the printing level of the cards. I mean, these components are top class. So, you know, in all fairness, and I argue about how that's a big strong point of the game in drawing people in. So I, I do think it's important to say that, yeah, I kind of get it. You know, you, you, have de you have taken a high design road with this to make something that's really beautiful, really elegant, that's got a great tactile feel to it. So at that point, you gotta say, well, okay, if we're gonna have that kind of experience, maybe it's got to be in that price range. So, you know, I'm, I don't really aim that as a criticism so much as I aim it as kind of, oh, it would be really nice if there are a little bit of optional rules so that as you get through the game, you know, like a half dozen, six to eight times, you're like, oh, well, we could add this in and try this just to give it a little bit more kind of variety and depth in the experience. The last thing I will mention is now, and I think it's the caveat here, right? There's an element of luck here. Now, when I mentioned this in one of our early reviews on the Sherman Leader Review, a few people mentioned comments like, well, all games have luck. Absolutely, all games have luck. And I don't think that's really the question though. I think the question is to what degree does luck influence the outcome in the game. And the, you know, the, the way the rating works in the game, whereas the Tripoli player, you're rolling a bunch of dice and you're trying to roll fives or sixes. As the US player to sink ships, you're trying to roll sixes and stuff like that. Yeah, and there's a lot of dice, which of course mitigates the, the luck factor. If you're rolling, you know, some of these attacks are like 20 dice. So that, that's for sure, the number of occurrences are going to limit the luck factor. Having said that, after playing the game as much as I've played the game, I feel like if you're a little bit lucky as the Tripoli player, and you're a little bit unlucky as the US player, the Triple E player is going to win. It's just flat out. There's just that little bit of game. Some, I've seen a number of games now that have tipped. It's like, well, Triple E player rolled kind of well, and the US player kind of didn't roll very well. Triple E is going to win. Now, if it's vice versa, if the US player rolls well and the Triple E player doesn't roll well, I think it's still game on. But it seems like there's a, just a little bit, that's the right way to put it, just a little bit too much of a luck element involved in having the Triple E player win. Now, I'm gonna, another caveat here too, because I think it's important to mention it. If you're playing this two player and you're introducing it to someone that hasn't played war games before, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because you can have your friend who hasn't played before play Tripoli and they're probably gonna do pretty well. They could kick your butt if they have some good rolls and you can't roll a six to save your life, right? Now you're in trouble as the US player. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I found myself at times wishing that that luck element in particular for the Tripoli's victory was a little bit dampened down, that there was some kind of a mitigating factor in there that would reduce me from feeling like, well, okay, Tripoli won, they rolled better than the US and so they won. Uh, but that's it really. I don't have anything else that I can look at and say, you know, I, I wish this, I wish that, or this is a drawback, this is it. The rule set's easy to read. Um, I think you know, it was super easy. I learned it again, I learned about 15, 20 minutes, so it's super easy to pick up and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm gonna go, if I wanna go through some of the numbers here and stuff like that, which I'm like, I will say a complexity, I'm gonna give this a two out of nine. On a replayability, I'm gonna go with a six out of nine. Uh, in terms of solitaire capacity, I'm gonna go with a nine out of nine. I found the solitaire mode in the game, playing as the US against Tripoli, very engaging. I loved it. I really, really liked it. It's just a lot of fun to play as a solo game. So for solitaire capacity, I'm gonna give it a nine as well too. And I think that brings us to the end. Uh, you know, I, 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 the bottom line is I heartily recommend this game. I think there's a lot more depth than I initially thought, which was, a really pleasant surprise. It's just an enjoyable experience to play. You know, it's a light touch, very accessible, plays fast. You can get through it in a half an hour to an hour, and yet it's gonna make you think. I like games that make you think, and I felt like this game challenged me to think quite a bit, despite on what the surface looks like a relatively simple set of mechanics and a simple set of cards that's gonna drive play. There's a lot more depth than meets the eye. And just for the fact that 
as a game that I can use to introduce to friends, this kind of ambassador game for wargaming, this will be my go-to game. I can't think of a better way, and I've got, again, those six friends in my head, maybe a little bit more, a few more, uh, people who like history but haven't played a ton of games. For those people, this makes for great evening's entertainment. I'll come back to it again and again for that purpose. And uh, love to hear your comments and questions down below. Uh, anything you've got, anything you found, anything you noticed? What's your thoughts on the game? Have you played it and things like that? And also, I'd point out that we do have a full playthrough on the channel of a three series, a three episode playthrough playing as the US solo player against the AAA AI bot, and then also an unboxing video as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, if you've enjoyed this review, please give it a thumbs up. If you are uh, new to the channel, please consider subscribing, and uh, we'll see you again in another episode coming up shortly. Thanks again, everybody. Take care.